Folks, we have an overweight and obesity problem in the United States. So I'm here to pose this question to you today. Is eating like a pig the cause or is it the solution? You know, we've seen all the graphs. We've seen that since the 1970s, older Americans have been getting larger and larger. But what's even more disturbing is that this trend over the same period of time is happening to children. Children are becoming more obese earlier and earlier in life. But the thing is, this isn't just an American concern. It's happening around the globe. Why is this happening? Even in impoverished nations, we're seeing an increase of obesity. In the United States alone, in 2012, there were 29 million diabetics. Eight million of those people were undiagnosed diabetics. We have 86 million pre-diabetics. What's shocking is this is nearly 40% of the U.S. population of Americans that are 20 years and older. That's insane. And what's even more shocking is this has happened in less than two generations. So something's going on more than just genetics. There must be something else linked to this. So with all this fatness and diabetes and chronic disease, we must be eating like pigs. Oh, folks, not so fast. Not so fast. You see, the pig gets a bad rap for all of this. We can use pigs as a perfect model to study how the diets that we consume impact our susceptibility to chronic disease. How the diets we consume, the different food combinations, are going to impact our body composition and our well-being. The headlines are confusing. We, we don't get very good dietary advice from the headlines. So what makes us fat and diabetic in the United States? It's a very complex topic. We're here, is it sugar? Is it total carbohydrates? Is it red meat? Is it dairy? Is it eggs? Is it total calories? Is it a sedentary lifestyle? Is it all of the above? When I think of all of the above, maybe this picture comes to mind. Fast food gets to blame a lot. Sedentary lifestyle, we're not expending the energy, cooking our own food, going to the grocery store, buying stuff. So we pull through the drive through and we order this. Two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun, large value meal. It's got all the evils of my list in there. It's got the sugar. It's got the carbohydrate. It's got the red meat. Whenever we hear experts talk about the evils of fast food, Almost entirely, we get the blame on the greasy burger. Let's look at the breakdown of the calories in that value meal, okay? I want to draw your attention to the two all-beef patties. Only 14% of the total calories of that value meal come from the two all-beef patties. But oftentimes, we give that 100% of the blame. Look around that pie chart. Over 70% of the total calories come from a carbohydrate source. Okay. I want you guys to think about what you ate during the work week last week or while you were going to school, throughout the day. Do some of these food items look familiar to you? Did you walk out of the door with that whole grain bagel and make that your breakfast? Did you frequent the vending machine several times for more whole grain in the form of sun chips? Did you go back and back again for another Snickers bar? In the late afternoon and Thursday, did you take in that high energy drink? More high energy drinks? On Friday, were you feeling guilty so you went out to lunch and had a healthy salad? You see, in the US, we snack and we don't eat a meal. We are a snack meal society. And no self-respecting hog farmer would ever feed their pigs this way. You see, this swine diet is balanced for energy and for protein. Let me clarify, not protein, amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks that make up those proteins. And there are nine essential amino acids that these pigs, that you humans, have to have in your diet every day. They are essential every day throughout the day, not just for your evening meal. They have to be there. 
Not all proteins are created equal. That bagel we saw is 250 calories and it's got eight grams of protein in it. But the burger, to get that eight grams of protein would only require one ounce of the burger and it would only be 50 calories. It is much more nutrient dense. So I would argue that the burgers are the most nutrient dense component of that value meal. The other thing we've learned from swine nutrition is that proteins from grains aren't as bioavailable to our digestive systems. They don't work for the pig as well as, the, as just as us. They don't work well for us. We don't digest them as well. That's why we take two relatively incomplete proteins like corn and soybeans and combine them to make a complete protein in that swine diet. The nine essential amino acids are so important and they are linked to so many aspects of global malnutrition that the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations put together an expert consultation. Now that's a big word for saying in, they brought in a bunch of really smart nutritionists to try to solve the protein quality problem around the world. One of their key findings was that those nine essential amino acids should be treated as separate nutrients. They should be included on a food label. We determine, they also found that we need to determine the quality of different proteins, like the whole grain bagel, like the ground beef. And we need to do that either testing it on humans, and if humans don't want to go through the procedure, the next best thing is the swine model. So we need to determine those essential amino acid bioavailability. Essential amino acid malnutrition is linked to all the physically expressed forms of malnutrition, including stunting, wasting, and obesity. Stunting occurs when there's a deficit of calories as well as a deficit of nutrients, whether it be amino acids, vitamin B12, iron, those are all nutrient deficiencies. And depending on the stage of life where this deficiency occurs, this stunting will either be mild or severe. If it happens early on, it can be more severe as opposed to later in life. Wasting, we typically think of that happening later in life, where a deficit of calories and nutrition can lead to the muscle basically eating itself, wasting away. So the muscle proteins are used to provide energy for the body. Now you're probably wondering, how can obesity be related to malnutrition? Well, let me tell you a story about a student of mine. His name is John. John graduated in 2010 and he got his dream job working as a pharmaceutical sales rep. And his region covered eastern Montana to western Minnesota to central South Dakota. So he's living the dream in his brand new car and he's adopted the snack meal lifestyle of the average American. So he wakes up at the hotel, he gets that continental breakfast, which I don't know what continent donuts come from, but that continental breakfast, he's saving the several muffins for riding in the car, he's downing it with coffee, he's happy, he's got pretzels, he's got uh, a stop at McDonald's for fast food lunch, and he's making sales right and left. He's a little tired in the afternoon, grabs a energy drink because that coffee just isn't working anymore. So this goes on for two years, three years. New pair of pants, new pair of pants, new pair of pants. Starts getting central adiposity. He's feeling kind of sluggish. He decides, I need to go on a diet. So he adopts the normal diet of salads and starts exercising a little more. He was, a, he was active in college. He was involved in intramurals. He was a fit guy. But more and more, as he's on the road and keeps continuing the same dietary choices, he feels sluggish. He finds it less easy for him to get to the gym because he's got chronic fatigue. So now he's progressing down that pathway of chronic disease. A year and a half ago, John was diagnosed with prediabetes. And they put him on a protocol to turn him, turn him around. So, when we feed pigs like humans, we do the reverse, we're not eating like pigs, pigs are eating like humans, here's what we see happening. Blood sugar increases, insulin increases, 
As that happens, an active muscle is good for taking that blood sugar and storing the blood sugar as glycogen in the muscle so the muscle can use that as energy. If we have sedentary muscle, the muscle gets full. It says, I've got enough energy, no more, no, no thanks. So it's the muscle that becomes resistant to insulin. So now that blood sugar can't get in the muscle, it returns to the liver, the liver turns it into triglycerides. Now we have elevated blood sugar, we have elevated triglycerides, and we have elevated insulin, three risk factors for prediabetes. So that, that energy's gotta go somewhere, insulin now unlocks the fat cells, and we see that central adiposity occur. There's another risk factor for prediabetes. So John was exercising, he used up that energy, the muscle sends a signal to the brain that says, hey, we need more energy down here, eat some more, get us another monster drink, man. We need some more energy in here. But that blood sugar goes up and it can't get into the muscle because insulin isn't unlocking the door for it to get in. So they eat, he's eating himself fatter and fatter. The muscle needs energy so it starts wasting the protein and his muscle shrinks and his fat cells get bigger. So how does this apply in a malnourished situation in an impoverished nation? So think about a humanitarian organization that is going to bring relief to a famine area. And they identify a literal boatload of corn and wheat that they're gonna to bring to this area. Because these people need calories. They need their energy, they need calories. But if we just supply that grain that is an inadequate source of those nine essential amino acids, sure, we get their calories up to over 2,000 a day, but now you can see the same similarities to the developed nation where John was over-indexing on those very starchy, sugary carbohydrates, and he wasn't paying attention to high-quality protein that included those nine essential amino acids. So we need to combine those grains with soybeans just like we did in the swine diet, literally eating like a pig. But this is not a mean-spirited saying. We're not comparing a group of people to the eating habits of an animal. We are using available scientific research that we already have on the animal agriculture side, and we're applying it at a biomedical level to save lives to improve life, to expand life so that people can live it and live it abundantly. My take home message for you today is this. In the United States, John, you, we have an abundant supply of choices for nutrient dense foods. There is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. So if you're as old as I am, don't dilute your nutrient dense foods with all this unnecessary starch and sugar. So yes, go ahead and eat like a pig, but I want you to concentrate on the quality of the diet, not the quantity.